Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Callum Russell. I'm the video team lead here at Career Foundry. I'm not the normal events host, but I'm standing in today. And I just wanted to welcome you to this live event with Maureen Herbin. So Maureen will be giving you a full introduction to design thinking today. Um, and whilst people are joining the room and um, joining the stream, I think we're also streaming this on YouTube and LinkedIn, hopefully. Uh, but while people are joining, just drop your name, where you're joining from and why you're interested in, um, in design thinking or a career change into tech in the chat. Um, and before we kick off and before I let Maureen introduce herself fully, uh, I'll briefly introduce you to Career Foundry. So Career Foundry is the online school for your career change into tech. Uh, we provide personalized programs in data analytics, digital marketing, product management, UX, UI design, and full stack web development. So the career change program takes you all the way from complete beginner to a job ready tech professional with one to one access to both a mentor and a tutor who are both experts working in your field. So uh, that's not all, if you can believe that. Um, so career friendly programs are also 100% online and flexible, which means you don't even need a job. Uh, sorry, which means you don't even need to quit your job at the time that you're um, undertaking them. And they're backed up by your job guarantee. So if you don't land a job in your new field within six months of completing the program, you get your tuition refunded. So that's enough from me. I will just point out some housekeeping rules. We'll keep all questions for Marine um, on topics of design thinking and UX and UI design to the end of the session, but we'll be curating all the questions and you can pop your questions in the chat. But I will now disappear into the background and let Maureen introduce herself. So Maureen, over to you. Thank you, Callum. All right. So um, Callum already introduced Career Foundry. I will introduce myself in a minute. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're going to look at today. So I'll explain what design thinking is, what the design thinking process is and the different steps that are involved. Also the value of design thinking, why it's useful, the context in which design thinking is useful, the relationship between user experience design and design thinking. And then lastly, to make it a little bit more concrete, the theory that we discussed today, um, I've taken an example of Uber Eats to show you how design thinking can be applied in a real world scenario. So um, I'm a Career Foundry alumni. I started my UX journey in 2017 and did the UX course. Currently I'm working as a senior product designer at Zalando, which is a fashion platform in Europe. And I also help UX beginners like you to kickstart their career on Instagram, where you can find me at ux.collection. And um, to jump into design thinking, I want to show something that isn't necessarily linked to design thinking, namely this chair. And if you are somewhat of a designer at heart, you probably recognize this design classic. And I would like you to think about what does this chair have to do with design thinking? Maybe you might already have a hunch. Or what might this shopping cart from IDEO have to do with design thinking? What, are, what is it that connects these two? What connects these two is that they are designed with a human-centric approach. And a human-centric approach is not something that is new with design thinking or that is unique to design thinking, but rather it has been practiced for ages already. And these, the chair that uh, Charles and Ray Eames designed, so this one, as well as the shopping cart are two physical examples of that. So design thinking is also not something that is necessarily practiced only for digital products, but also for physical products. Now, of course, when, um, the, when Charles and Ray Ames designed this chair, they didn't call it design thinking, but what they were doing in essence can be called design thinking because what they were trying to create was a chair that above all was comfortable, was inviting, and they had the needs of their user in mind. Quite like what we do when we design digital products nowadays. Now, IDEO is the company that popularized design thinking or that brought design thinking to the masses. They're not the ones that invented it, 
but they did play a big role into it. And the way they did that was by um, bringing their toolkit and their process to the mainstream. And a good idea of this or a good example of this is the shopping cart. This example really shows how IDEO works. And as you can see, this example is from 1999. And I purposely choose something that has already been existing for so long to show you that design thinking is not something from the past few years. It's been around for a while already. And what made this so special is that this shopping cart was designed in just five days by a multidisciplinary team. This already shows two characters of design thinking, namely one, you can arrive to um, a solution relatively fast and it's multidisciplinary. So it is something that not only designers can do, but that many different roles can use. The way they came about with the shopping cart, which looks very different from what shopping carts usually look like, is that they actually went to supermarkets and they observed how people do their groceries. And based on these observations, they learned more about what people's needs are when they're shopping around and they better understood the behavior of the customers. And based on those observations, they designed a shopping cart with removable plastic baskets, with a scanner. Nowadays, you see these scanners quite often, but back then that was something that was new. And also with wheels that would allow the cart to move um, more fluidly, so to say. So what they did in short was that they put the user in the center. They designed based on the needs of the people that they were designing for. And that is one of the key elements of design thinking. It's to design user-centered. If you want to know more about the shopping cart, there is a whole documentary of this on YouTube. Just type in IDEO shopping cart and you'll find, uh, I think the first result is already the documentary. So what is design thinking exactly? I think there are a lot of different opinions on this, on what design thinking is, and especially what the value of design thinking is. There are also lately quite some critical voices around that. But how Tim Brown, who is the uh, part of the executive chair of IDEO, how he defines it is that design thinking is a human-centered approach to innovation that draws from the designer's toolkit to integrate the needs of people, the possibilities of technology, and the requirements of business success. So that's a lot of words. What do they mean? Basically, what design thinking does is it finds this sweet spot between something that is viable, so something that's profitable for a business to build, something that's feasible, something that we can actually build because we have the technology or the tools at hand, and something that's desirable, so something that people want and need. Now, to, to um, put that into, like, to, to summarize that, the question that design thinking helps us answer is, can we make it? Can we make it profitable? And can we make it in such a way that people want it? Now, if you look um, on Google what design thinking is, you will find images that look like this. And this is also one of the reasons why some people have problems or see design thinking skeptically or critically. And that's because these images make it look like design thinking is just a simple five or six step plan, just a simple process that you just throw on every, on every design problem and you magically get the solution. And that's not how it actually works. So design thinking is not just like a simple process with the same steps that you use all the time exactly in that order. But design thinking is more, the name already says it, a mentality 
And the way that we try to visualize that mentality is by making diagrams like this. Now, a better way to visualize the design thinking process is to show it as a loop or a circle. And usually you will see that design thinking consists of five steps, namely empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And what Annan Group did in this diagram, and which is actually crucial, is a sixth step, which is implement. Because of course you can think about the best solutions and test them all you want, but if you never implement them, then these solutions won't help people. And what this diagram also shows is that the design thinking process is not linear. It's not step one to five or step one to six, and then you're done, but it's more a loop. It's something that constantly feeds into each other. So let's take a closer look at each of these phases. So you start the design thinking process with the phase that's called empathize. empathize. And that is where you try to understand your user. So that's where you usually do user research. You try to understand the user needs, the problems, the behaviors, and you really try to build a broad picture of who this user exactly is and what the challenges are that they are facing. In the next step, in the definition step, you're going to define the challenge that you want to solve. Now, people are very complex. They have a lot of different challenges and, and issues. You can solve everything all at once. So the definition phase is there to really focus on what's that one challenge that we want to solve based on the research that we've done. When you have defined this problem space, you're moving on to the third phase, which is called ideate. And when you're ideating, you are going to brainstorm different solutions to this problem space that you've defined. So this is where, um, let's say, the creativity in the classic word kicks in. This is where we start sketching, where we start collecting ideas and brainstorming concepts. And when you have ideas that you feel confident about and that you believe might pose a solution to the problem space, that's when you move on to the prototyping phase. And that's where you are going to build a prototype with all these ideas that you've gathered before. And the goal of this prototype is to have something that you can in the next phase test with the users. And this is a very important phase because we can do as much research as we want and we can brainstorm as many ideas as we want. But in the end of the day, you will need to test your hypotheses, your, your proposed solutions to see if they actually solve the problem that your users are facing. And that's why this testing phase is very important. And oftentimes diagrams that focus on design thinking end here, but that's of course not how it works in reality, because in reality, companies are not just focused on testing, but more realistically, they're more focused on implementing. So what you will find is when you work as a UX designer is that this testing phase, which in theory is very important, might actually be overshadowed by the next step, namely, let's build this and let's bring it to the market. So this design thinking process is something that is extremely helpful to adapt a designer's way of thinking, a designer's mentality that starts out of curiosity, that puts the user in the center, but it might not always reflect the reality. And that is something that I will discuss a little bit later. So let's take a deeper look into this. So design thinking is more than a process. It's, in my opinion, more like a mindset. It's a strategy and it's a way to solve problems by design while using empathy and creativity. So when you have this design thinking process, the at least the mistake that I made in the beginning 
was to think, okay, this is my my magic potion now. I'm just going to throw this on everything and automatically I will get all the answers. However, in reality, product development and, and creating new services and digital products isn't that clean and that straightforward. There are a lot of different factors that influence this and where you don't necessarily have um, all the answers within design thinking. So for example, what I found when I started my first UX job is that I was so confused because I had this perfect process and I couldn't apply it because in the projects that we were working with, we already skipped research because research was already done and we couldn't do as much testing because there was no budget and the client was breathing in our necks to finish this project as soon as possible. So I found that it was pretty hard for me to navigate these different phases and that they're not clearly following each other, but rather happening simultaneously, or maybe some phases might be skipped, or maybe you're joining a project mid design thinking process. So treat design thinking as a theory, as an inspiration of how products might be developed, but it's not the end all of things. Reality is way more chaotic than the design thinking process might make it look like. Now, that's the downside of design thinking. The good side of design thinking is that it is, even though it's called design thinking, it is really for many different roles that you can find in a company. So it's not just only for designers, but it's really for everyone who is involved in the product development process, so to say. So also product owners can use this. Also marketing people can use this or managers. And the benefit that design thinking has for these roles is that they allow people a mindset shift. So uh, this is another surprise that I saw when I uh, started out as a UX designer. I assumed that everyone in the company would understand that it is very important to understand your users or your customers because these are the people that will bring money into the company in the end. And what I found while I was working is that a lot of people in a company um, are very far away from the lives of customers. They're not really aware of who these customers are and what problems they're trying to solve. And this was really new to me because I expected everyone to understand who the customer was, but that's not really the reality. If you're working somewhere for a long time or you're working in a company or in an industry for a long time, you might get a little bit of tunnel vision and you might be more focused on the business constraints and on the business goals more than what would, sell, what would help the customer. And so what design thinking does is bringing back that focus to be user-centered. And that is something that where different roles within a company can find a common ground and where we as designers can play a facilitating role by saying, hey, no, let's do some research. Like, let's look at research. Let's try to understand our customer. And through that, try to understand the problem. Because what you'll find is that oftentimes people focus on what they think the problem is but that's more the problem out of a company point of view rather than a user-centered point of view. Now, what all of this does, what working based on research does is that it avoids opinion-based solutions and provides you with real data where you can focus your solutions on. So instead of someone saying, well, I just like it when the button is red, you can actually do research, make proposals, test it to see if this is actually true. Another cool thing that design thinking does and where we, again, as designers can play a facilitating role is that it can help you generate ideas. So it gives different methods and tools that helps people to brainstorm with purpose and with focus. Because if you're just gonna sit together with five people around the table, and you say, well, 
let's now brainstorm great ideas. It might not be as effective as when you have proper tools and methods in your skill set that can help you facilitate these brainstorm sessions. So design thinking, the, the value of design thinking really lies into bringing that user-centered focus in allowing people the space to generate new ideas, to be more experimental, to focus your solutions on research. But that is not to say that business constraints are not important. In fact, as UX designers, it is very important that we not only bring in the user perspective, but that we also understand the business perspective because what customers or what users want and what is profitable for a company is not always the same thing. And that's where the challenge of our job lies in, in balancing these two. So again, think back on this um, triangle that I showed in the beginning of desirability, viability, and feasibility. It's really finding that sweet spot. And for that, you also need to understand business constraints. So when is design thinking useful? It's useful for both new products and services as well as existing products and services. So it's especially useful if you want to bring new products and services to the market because the solutions that you will come up with are based on research and they're tested before they're implemented. This also reduces the time to market. And this might sound a little bit weird because you might think, well, there are all these steps. How can this actually reduce the time to market? So the time it takes for the product to be on the market and sold, it actually makes it faster because you're moving in faster, smaller steps. So it's an iterative process. That means that you come up with an idea, you create a prototype, you test it, you take that feedback and that feedback, you, you use it to make a better prototype, to make improvements, to test those again. And while you move in these smaller steps, you get a better idea of what resonates with the market. And so in the end of the day, you can actually bring a product that is desirable to the market faster than when you to think, well, now let's create this piece of software and we're going to work on it for three to five years and build everything from scratch up to a fully functioning product. And then in the end, you find out that that is not really what people want. Or you find out that there is a competitor that already does this better. So by moving in smaller, faster steps, you can gauge the interest of the market in a better way. And another benefit of that is that you also save costs because you're putting out prototypes, you're putting out initial ideas, and you're testing the waters with them before you commit to really investing a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of resources into creating what you think is the perfect solution, even though it might not be. So that's where it design thinking might help uh, new products and services, but also when you are working on something that already exists, an app that already exists, or an online shop that already exists, you can still use this mentality to improve these existing products by doing more research, by understanding your customers or your users. And you'll find that the more research you do, the better understanding you get. And one of the, the um, most profound things for me, even though this sounds very, very obvious, is to realize that the people that you're designing for, they have a whole life. There's a lot happening in their life that's just outside of your product. So for example, uh, I work at Salando, which is a, a fa an online fashion platform People that shop jeans at Zalando, that's not the only thing they're doing with their life, or at least I hope not. 
they also do a lot of different other things. And the more you understand their life, the more complete idea you get from their needs, their behaviors, um, the things that they're trying to accomplish. And those adjacent lifestyle choices, let's say, they also feed into how you might improve your product. So understanding customers as a whole, as their whole life, actually helps us even when it's a very niche product or a very niche area that we're working in. And by better understanding these needs, we can come up with better ways to cater to these customers and make sure that they keep on using our products and that they stay loyal to our products. So it all boils down to doing that research, understanding how customers work so that we can make a more educated guess when we are brainstorming that we can prototype and test before we build something. All right, so um, what's the deal with UX design and design thinking? If you are new in your UX journey, then you probably already heard about design thinking, but you might be wondering what's the difference? Is it the same thing? Are UX designers design thinkers? What's the difference here? Now, UX design is about solving the right problem, is about trying to figure out what is it that we're trying to solve here and having a toolkit that can help us solve this problem. And that toolkit is design thinking. There are many different methods and strategies and tools that UX designers use, but especially when you're early on your learning journey with, within UX design, then I think design thinking is a good place to start because it can give you a feeling of what are these tools and what are these methods that UX designers use. So UX design is about solving the right problem. And you could say that design thinking is about solving the problem right by giving these tools and these methods to do research, to brainstorm ideas, to build prototypes, to test them. So design thinking is really like the, the little suitcase that you bring to solve your problems. Now, this is just one opinion on what design thinking and UX design um, differentiates. Now, differentiates, difficult word. Now, um, what I already said in the beginning is that there are many different opinions on what UX design and design thinking exactly is, how they're connected to each other or how they are different from each other. So what I'm showing you here is just my interpretation, but I really encourage you to do your own research and to really dig into what design thinking is and the many different opinions there are out there because that is what makes our job so exciting is that a lot of people have different perspectives on things. And by reading many different perspectives, you can learn more about what our profession exactly is and you can build your own opinion on this. So for me, design thinking is a particular approach that's focused on the mindset and that is developed to enhance or design job or design activities. And that it does that by offering different methodologies and different toolkits. Now, when you're wondering what are these tools and what are these methodologies, we don't have time today to really dig deeper into these, but I would encourage you to just Google IDEO design thinking toolkit, and then you will come to a website where they have many different methods and many different tools that can help you within each phase of design thinking. So they have tools that are particular to research. They have tools that are particular to brainstorming. And so you can kind of understand the, the, the hammers and the screw drivers that UX designers use. So in the end of the day, 
very generic, very generic approach is to say that UX designers are trying to create solutions that are useful, usable, and desirable, both for users as well as for businesses. And I stress this because I think it's very important to understand that even though our job title is called user experience designer, there are no users without companies. There are no customers without companies. So it's always important that you also understand the business side of things, because if we would just be doing what users say we should do, we would probably be out of a job really fast. So this is something that is always important to keep in mind. We have a focus that is user centric, but that doesn't mean that we should just ignore whatever business constraints or business goals we have to work with. So design thinking is very much a part of UX design. It's the toolkit that UX designers use. Now, how does that look like in real life? I found an example of how Uber Eats uses design thinking. This is an article that I took from um, Medium, and it's already a little bit older. So the, the Uber Eats app or features might look different now, but it doesn't matter for this example because this example really just shows how these different phases can be translated to an actual product like an app. So what the designers of Uber Eats did is they started with this, this empathize phase that we talked about in the beginning, and they tried to understand how people consume food, the relationship that people have with food. And like I already told you before, people are complex. There are a lot of different things that are happening at the same time in our lives. One of them might be ordering food, but you can also... Imagine when you think about your own life, there's more that you're trying to do on a day-to-day -day basis than just cooking or ordering food. So what the Uber team did is they immersed themselves in the food culture of different cities to really understand these eating habits, the infrastructure of a city, where do people get their food? And they really went out in the field to understand and identify with these customers, with these users. And they had different tools or different ways that they did this. For example, there was something that was called the, the walkabout program where they visited a city where Uber Eats is active and they learned about the food culture. They interviewed people, they did order shadowing, which is where they observed how the users order through Uber Eats, follow the food delivery partners on their deliveries, visit restaurants, sit in people's home, and really try to understand how this whole ecosystem works. And what is so interesting about a product like Uber is that they have many different users. So we, they have people like us who might be sitting at home and want to order food, but they also have the Uber driver that needs to bring that food to you. And they also have the restaurants that are preparing the food and that need to give that to the Uber driver. So they have many different users. And now you might start to see the, the benefit of this design thinking approach. It helps you to understand these different kind of users and their needs and behaviors. Because obviously a Uber driver has different challenges and needs than me waiting at home for my pizza to be delivered. Then they also did things like fireside chats where they invited customers to talk about their experiences and where they can really have face-to-face -face contact and have the opportunity to ask questions. Now, when they did all of that, they understood the food culture, they talked with the many different uh, customers or users they understood how this whole process works in real life. That's when they moved on to the next phase, to the definition phase. And that's where they defined a service for these different user segments. So for the drivers, for the restaurants, and also for the 
people that order takeaway food. And one of the challenges that Uber Eats has on top of having these different user segments is that they also have to connect the digital with the physical world because we are ordering the food on our app. So that's a digital experience, but the Uber driver needs to physically drive to the restaurant, pick up the food and deliver it to us. So that's a physical experience. And how can you make sure that these two fit into each other and work as one unified experience? Now, one way to uh, figure all of that out is when they moved to the ideation phase. And this is where they did innovation workshops and they used design thinking methods to look at cha the challenges that they had in new ways. They uh, drive inspiration from other departments and they came up with different ideas, different feature ideas. Now, how this works in detail, I'm not so sure because as I said, I based this on the Medium article that is linked here as well. And usually you, you don't really find as much detail about how companies exactly come up with their solutions because they want to protect that, of course. But after they've come up with um, a certain like ideas or solutions that they want to test, that's when they moved to prototyping. And that's what I met, meant before that design thinking can actually accelerate your product going to the market by doing something that Uber Eats called rapid field testing, which is just testing mockups, so prototypes in real life to see how people interact with it. Um, another thing they did was A-B testing. If you're learning about UX design, you probably hear about A-B testing many more times. A-B testing is where you test multiple versions or variants of a feature. So to boil that down to like something really simple, going back to the example that I just mentioned with the buttons, which button is <laughs> better performing, red or blue? That could be an A-B test. Usually A-B tests are a bit, bit better well-defined than what I just said, but it's testing version A and B against each other and see which one converts better or which one saves more costs or whatever the incentive is. And what they also did, and this is something um, where luckily there is more and more attention to this coming, they also defined success metrics and they measured these with data analytics. And this is something that um, more recently is becoming more and more in the center of attention also within our field is working with data sets, working with analytics, because we can interview as many people as we want, but to have really good research and to have really good user testing, you should not just only ask people, what do you think of this? Or try to understand them through user interviews, but you should also fact check that with quantitative data. So with analytics, with surveys, with things that go high in numbers so that you can prove the anecdotes that you hear. And that's exactly what Uber Eats also did. So um, this is one example of how design thinking is used. Like I said before, the app might look different now, but this can give you a feeling of what these different phases mean and the different tools that can be used. Again, if you want to learn more about the different tools of design thinking, Google the IDEO toolkit. There are many different toolkits. I've linked all of them in the back of this presentation. You also have the Hyper Island toolbox, which is great if you want to learn more about the different brainstorming methods that you can use to come up with better ideas. OK. Uh, I see that we are quite well in time. I'm happy with that because that means we have more time for questions. And so I would say now, if you have any questions, maybe Callum, you can help me to sort out these questions. And for those of you who are interested, there is more information on design thinking that I've linked here. I'm not sure if people get the presentation afterwards. 
I don't think we share the slides, but they'll get um, the access to the recording. So they'll have all the slides and we can we can see okay. and share some of the links as well. Yeah, we can, then, yeah, exactly. You can add the links. Cool. All right. Cool. So that was great. See. Thank you so much, Maureen. That was really interesting. Um, before we get into the Q&A section, because we've got a really quite a large audience today tuning in from all around the world, which is really cool to see. But I just want to make the audience aware that um, this September at Career Foundry, we're offering a Women in Tech Scholarship which is worth 18.5% off our main career change programs. Um, so we hope that women, our Women in Tech Scholarship encourages even more women to pursue careers in the tech industry and become leaders in tech fields. Um, if you're interested in claiming your scholarship, you can book a quick call with one of our program advisors. Um, and you can also click the, the um, sticky note at the top on Big Marker if you're tuning in there. If you're watching on LinkedIn or YouTube, we can maybe even share the link in the, in the live chat as well. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your presentation, Maureen. I think we can dive into some of the questions now. And I do apologize in advance if I, if I pronounce anyone's name wrong. Um, let's start with one from Claudia. Or Claudia. Um, yeah. Do you think small companies don't value or understand the importance of user experience and design thinking processes? And what can we do to change this? Um, I think that happens because oftentimes especially for a smaller company, it's important that you make money so that you survive. And that is why if people are new or unfamiliar with design thinking practices, they might not see the value of it because it sounds to them as if it's extra work, which is never a good sign for small companies because they don't have extra time for extra work. So I think one of the important tasks for us as designers is not necessarily, is also to um, design things, but it's also to explain to people a, the way that we work. So explain the value of design. And I think one way to convince smaller companies is by trying to understand what is it that they are struggling with? What is it that your manager or your client um, is fearful of? Is it they don't have time, they don't have budget, they don't have resources. And then try to find arguments within design thinking, within the process of how that might alleviate their issues. So I think when we do user research, we oftentimes think about the users of the product, the users or customers of this company. But you can apply the same way of thinking to your managers and to your colleagues and to whoever it is that is blocking you and, and being annoying, so to say, at work because these people also have needs. And when we can understand the business goals and the business needs and we can match them with the user goals and the user needs, then you can build a case of why they might need to adapt new ideas or of why they might need to try out something new. And maybe you might come to the conclusion that the problem is not coming up with a new product, but the problem is something that's internal. And that is something that I definitely have learned in the past few years is that the, this internal perspective, this business perspective is very important too, because that influences the resources that influences how they work with customers. That's a great answer. Um, you mentioned smaller companies. Or do you feel design thinking maturity, or maybe you've already answered this, but design thinking maturity, does it change across um, the tech field, like smaller startups and larger corporates? Like I imagine there's a bit of a, a flip-flop um, with how some companies approach it. Like smaller startups might not have very much money, but might sort of mm -hmm. evangelize design thinking. Have you found that in your experience or...? Do you have any examples of that? Um, uh, in my experience, it's not so much about how big a company is if they are open for design, because also really big companies can have a low UX maturity, is how we call it. I think it's more about um, what's the what's the mindset of this ma of the managers? How do they approach things? Do they approach things out of a product point of view? then it might be easier for us to establish these design practices. But if they approach things out of a different point of view, for example, an operational point of view, it might be a bit more difficult. Um, but one 
benefit of course when you work in a big company is that they have more money so they also have more possibilities to hire designers user researchers and whatnot and so the design maturity grows because they bring in more of that expertise that's great and, and maybe leading on from that question agnes has asked um I'm wondering how we can deal with budget restrictions when using design thinking, using the design thinking mindset, especially when it comes to user testing. Do you have mm -hmm. any insights into how you personally use the design thinking mindset in your own work? I think that's relating specifically to user testing and yeah. budget. For that. Yeah, that is a problem I can really <laughs> re resonate with because I, I think every designer will have a point in their life, or maybe a, it's a continuous struggle for us to convince the people that have the money in hand that we should test and the reality is that sometimes you can only test once and that is really a shame because we all understand as designers that it is important to test more times but in my experience sometimes you just have to take your losses and sometimes that means you can only do one user testing and then it's really important that you really prioritize together with your manager or together with your client or whoever is responsible for this budget, what is it that we want to test? Because if you only have one chance, you need to make sure that the things that you do test can give you useful feedback to improve your concepts. Now, you, might, you, you will also find with the more experience that you get that sometimes there are things that we can already make an educated gas on. So maybe we don't really need to test these smaller things so we can test other things. But um, if ideally you can find arguments why doing multiple tests pays out in the long run. However, the reality is that sometimes there is just no money and then you just have to take whatever you have and you do one test and whenever you get feedback on that or you'll find that that one test did not give you all the answers then that is actually an argument to go to your managers and say well you know this is why we should test more because if we only test once we see that we don't have enough feedback and so we can't improve the product as well that's great and, and another question again um loosely linked to that but from beatrice um Beatrice would like to know, what are your tips for communicating your design thinking approach to your colleagues or superiors in a meeting or a portfolio? The best way for me that I found is to make them part of it. So instead of going in and, and kind of having that mindset of, I have all the tools and let me tell you how to do things, make your colleagues, your clients, your managers, part of the design process. That doesn't mean that they should do your job, but it means that from the beginning, invite them to user interviews, share the research insights with them, do a brainstorm idea session with them, make them part of the really rough sketches, the really rough wireframes, really report back to them often and transparently so that they understand what you're doing because that is the real challenge here for us this process might seem very logical but for people that are familiar unfamiliar with it it just might seem like one big chaos and that brings distrust so if you make them part of this early on they feel invested and they can follow the different steps and they can understand why you're doing things so the best way for me to win people on my side and to make them understand design practices by, is by doing it together with them. That's great. And, and similar, uh, similar question, but um, from Ashitosh, how do you balance business demands versus user needs? So maybe you've already kind of slightly covered that with your answer, but um, perhaps less about getting the buy-in from stakeholders, but maybe more of the business uh, mm -hmm. they don't necessarily value elements of design thinking. How would you, get the, how would you balance that demand um, versus a, a user's needs? Um, the same way that you interview users, you can also interview your colleagues. So that is actually something that we do a lot at Zalando, where we uh, start with 
internal interviews. So um, I, I interview different managers or different colleagues from different departments to understand what they are working on, what the problem is that they are trying to solve before I interview users, because that gives me the a better understanding of what is it, what are the challenges that we internally are facing in Zalando and what are the agendas, what are the goals that my colleagues are trying to reach. With that knowledge in mind, I interview the users to kind of understand, okay, this is what Zalando internally is trying to achieve. This is what the Zalando customers are trying to achieve. And then you try to bring these two together. You try to see commonalities. And sometimes you'll be at a point where there are no commonalities or they seem very contradictory. And that is where you then work together with these colleagues. So you make them part of your process to better understand, is this internal goal really that important? Or did we maybe define it wrong because it's so um, opposing of the customer problem. So maybe we should reshift or focus to a more user-centered perspective. So it's really about understanding the both sides and then working together with, ideally with colleagues and customers to really figure out what exactly is the problem here from these both sides and how can we build upon that. And what you will find again, um, because that's just how the reality is, sometimes you have the chance to build something with a stronger user-centered perspective. But a lot of times you will also just have to build something with a stronger business perspective because that is what will bring in money. And then it's just more of a long game where you're thinking, okay, now we're going to build this, which might not be as user-centric as I would like it to be, but I'm just going to pour some water to the wine so that on the next step, we can move a little bit closer to customer centric. So that's also one way to balance these things is to be open to compromise. You cannot all, you can almost never have it your way. <laughs> so you will have to find really a balance of how you can take something to then leap forward. That's a great answer. And maybe shifting from, from the user customer focus, but Melissa has a, a question here, how can design thinking be applied to B2B models of business? Do you have any experience or insights on that? Yeah, I also worked in the B2B space. In the B2B space, you also have users. You know, they might not be the people that um, pay for the product in the end. So like bringing it back to Zalando, it might not be the, the person that's buying the jeans, but it might be the clothing brands selling the jeans to Zalando. And again, it's the same kind of process that you can apply there because it's just a different focus, but you will still have users that you're working together with. They're just not the end user. Okay, that's great. Um, I have a personal question I was curious. And do you have any design mm -hmm. thinking resources? So, I mean, if people were to go from, from this event, um, what would be your go-to resources, whether it's books or podcasts or blogs? Um, where could you learn more and actually... Um, practice some design thinking elements? What would be your go-to resources for that? Yeah, so that is what um, what I've also linked here. So I know that at Career Foundry, they actually have a very comprehensive beginner's guide that lists all of this that we've discussed in text, if you want to read it through. And then two toolkits that I found very useful, especially in the beginning of my career, is this design kit, the IDEO toolbox that I mentioned before and also the toolbox of Hyper Island. Those are two good toolkits to start with, but you will also find that when you Google design thinking toolkits, there are dozens, but these are the two that really list like the most essential tools, so to say, or the most essential methods that you can start with. That's great, thank you. Um, I've got a question here from, I, I hope I pronounced this right, Ogun Fetimi, I think. Um, so a question, how can one identify the problem to be solved in an already existing and functioning product? And I'm already thinking here, maybe something along the lines of like design sprints, um, but um, do you have any insight on that? Yeah, so this is actually an, an, a, a very realistic scenario. When you start somewhere, when you start working at a company, it is very likely that they already have a product and they already have defined the problem 
you were just not part of that phase. And um, I think the, the best way to is to always first do um, take account of whatever exists in a company. So whatever research is already done, do they have customer journey maps? Do they have personas? Do they have research insights that are collected somewhere? Because that will give you a better idea of the knowledge that already exists in the company and the problems that they're trying to solve. So read the company strategy, for example, to better understand what is it that they're heading towards. So if you already have that knowledge of what, what they already did before you joined the company, then um, you will see this design thinking process as a loop. So what I mentioned in the beginning, that there is not just one phase where you're going to empathize, but it's something that happens continuously. So when you start at this new company and they already have a product and they already did research, then you'll find that at some point you have the opportunity to again do new research, to build upon these insights that already exist. And you'll find that maybe some problems are already defined and we are we already have solutions to them, but we want to improve the solutions or we find that the problem has now slightly changed. So we need to figure out what it is that customers are now trying to solve. You know, like pro products also develop over time. So it's not like you define the problem once and then you're done with it, but you're constantly redefining things. You can see it. I'm not sure if this is a good a good metaphor, but you could maybe see it like your life goals. You know, when you were five, you had different life goals than you have now. So these things constantly develop based on the experiences that you have, the new insights that you have. And it's the same with a product, how a product starts out. They have very different problems than when a product already exists for five years and already has a customer base. And now Maybe the issue is not getting a market. Now the issue is growing a market. So this definition is also cyclical, is, is continuous. That's great. I have a question, um, maybe more at the kind of the beginner stage of it. But when you're building a UX portfolio, um, do you have any tips for kind of highlighting design thinking projects in your UX portfolio? Um, what would that maybe look like? And, and what could you do if you don't have any prior work experience to kind of highlight your design thinking uh, knowledge so here i'm gonna <laughs> repeat what my man career foundry mentor said to me in 2017 treat your portfolio like treat your portfolio like a ux project you've learned all the tools you've learned this design thinking mentality and process and you understand that you need to do user research come up with solutions test them prototype them the same thing you can do with your portfolio. So before you make a portfolio, figure out who is this portfolio for? For what kind of job do I want to apply to? What's the challenge that this company that I want to apply to is trying to solve? And you can find that by Googling their strategies, by reading press releases, by checking if they if they're in a, a stock note if they have stocks like if they are noted on the um, index I'm not sure how you say that in English you can find a lot of news about that so treat the company treat this job application as your user do research and then fit your portfolio to that and that brings me to the first question which is how can you get um, experience when you don't have work experience yet or how can you get case studies there are many different ways again you have this toolkit as a ux designer you should know by now that there are many different ways to come up with a solution that's the one thing that you're learning so if you don't have a work experience join online hackathons do personal side projects connect with people on slack or on discord try to find people that you can do a project with together do charity work Create a website for your uncle's business. Help a local school with their website. There are many different ways to get work experience without it being a full-time job. Like the, the, the first thing is for you to practice these things. 
And then um, you asked, how can we showcase the design thinking methods? So I think it's more important that you showcase the mentality, that you showcase that you understand the value of research, that you understand the value of thinking broad, having lots of different ideas before you narrow it down again. More so, that's more important than showing here's a persona, here's a user flow, here is a user interview, because these methods are known within the field. What's way more important for recruiters is to understand is that they understand or they see that you understand why do you make a per persona? Why do you make a user flow? Why do you make, why do you do user interviews? So your portfolio should focus more on the why rather than the what. Okay, now I've, I, <laughs> I hope I answered all of these questions. Great answer, yeah, it was a three-parter. I loved it. <laughs> But, you know, I think that's that's very correct and definitely cater your portfolio more to the, the job you're applying for. Definitely, that's very sound advice. I'm just conscious of time and I realize we've got a lot of questions. I think it's quite a large audience today and I realize we've not been able to get through all the questions, unfortunately. Um, but just to reiterate, this recording will be emailed out to everyone that signed up for the event, whether they attended or not. Um, and it will also be available to watch back on demand, um, both on our events portal and on our YouTube channel. Um, maybe just to round off, Maureen, um, and one last question um, mm -hmm. from Jacob um, in Big Marker here. How do we differentiate between being creative and thinking using design, or are they one and the same? I like that question. Um, well, that, def that, de that depends on how you define creativity. Oftentimes, creativity is defined as being artistic, coming up with the wildest, most artistic, most creative ideas. Creativity as a UX designer is not necessarily coming up with the shiniest solution or the most artistic or the most wi wild solution, but it's using um, your curiosity, using your um, toolkit to come up with solutions that fit many different factors. So like what we've been talking before, combining user and business goals. Mm -hmm. So the creativity is more based on that, on how can you balance many different factors into one elegant solution? And that's where you can use design thinking for. So um, is, design like, is design thinking creative? Yes in the sense that it allows you to come up with new ideas for complex problems with many different factors. Is design thinking artistic in the way that a painter is artistic? Not necessarily because um, it's way more methodolog methodological. So it's, it's way more, um, we have a certain sets of tools that we can use and it's less about reinventing the wheel, the way that art reinvents the wheel. That was a great answer. <laughs> I think that was a fantastic answer to close on. Um, so we have actually reached our time, ran over a little bit, but I just want to thank you again, Maureen, for your fantastic presentation. These are always an absolute joy, um, and I'm sure we'll have events uh, in the very near future again with you. Um, a, per a quick personal plug, um, um, acting in my own self-interest here, but if you haven't already subscribed to our YouTube channel, Maureen is in a, a wide array of videos all around UX design and design thinking on our YouTube channel. Um, and all our events are also hosted there and our live streams as well. So I just want to thank you, our audience, for, for tuning in. We've had people from all over the world uh, tune in today, Maureen, which is fantastic to see. Um, and just a reminder that our Women in Tech scholarship will end at the end of September. So if you are eligible and want to try and claim your 18.5% um, um, scholarship discount, you can click uh, the link here in big marker above the, the chat tab um, to book a call with one of our program advisors. And, and if you're interested in a career in UX and UI design or UX or UI design, you can check out one of our free short courses over on Career Foundry's website. And with that, I will wish you all a good evening or good morning, um, a good afternoon, depending on which side of the globe you're tuning in from. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you again, Maureen. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. I also really liked it. I also like 
how many questions always come in. I wish we had more time for those, maybe in the future. And uh, yeah, if anyone has any more questions, my DMs are always open. So you can also ask your question there. That's great. I'm sure we can put some of these questions into a really nice YouTube video as well. <laughs> but thanks a lot, folks, and have a great day. Bye.